Hello and welcome to episode number eight of Pass. Uh, today's episode is going to be extremely special. It's not only the first inter international guest I do have, it's the first athlete I have. So I'm extremely excited for this episode. Please, you guys like and subscribe and do all the comments, all the, all the good stuff. And before I introduce, before you bring, bring in my guest to our uh, in the meeting, I just, want, I just want to give us an introduction. Uh, in, the, in her Instagram bio, it says fighter, and she's a fighter in every aspect. Uh, normally in a ring the ring on the mat but she fight she fought away for her dreams and to fly all the way across continents to chase her dream please welcome in our guest tina but one is hopefully it's the name right but yeah <laughs> let's bring her in hi thank you <laughs> nice intro thanks so much i tried it's last minute <laughs> no 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 it's all good a lot of people struggle so it's no big yeah. deal yeah so firstly how are you how is germany um, I'm doing well. Uh, Germany is pretty good. The weather has been holding up, thank God, but we're yeah. quite well known for like our rainy days. Yeah. So, yeah, but it's been good. Yeah. Does it snow too in the winter? Um, yeah, it does snow. We didn't have yeah. too much snow last winter, but um, yeah, towards spring, we did get a lot more snow, which was, yeah, interesting. Yeah. yeah. Was there a bit of a shock when you moved from... Uh... Australia, Australia to Australia to over here to Germany. Uh, the snow. Yeah. Um, not really a shock. I expected it to be colder, but it was actually more just beautiful rather than, uh, mm. like cold. To be honest, yeah. And I don't, I don't actually know. You're from America, right? I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, I'm in California, so it doesn't snow or anything. Oh, uh, okay. Quite yeah. warm. Yeah. Uh, it usually gets like around like zero degrees celsius but it doesn't mm -hmm. snow like in the winter and in the summer it gets quite hot it's i don't know how, it's, how much is in celsius but it's about like 110 fahrenheit so it's, it gets mm -hmm. pretty hot in the summer so it's like both extremes but it doesn't snow though yeah okay no 110 like it's that's pretty hot yeah it, it gets pretty hot over here <laughs> yeah. yeah damn so are you studying are you a student um i don't actually know yeah so i'm I mean, a student i'm, I'm yeah. i study right now i'm doing masters in my mechanical engineering okay yeah, I'm currently at, at a college university. My internet at home wasn't great, so I had to come to the university. <laughs> yeah, it happens a lot. My internet also isn't always the best, but it's cool that you can go out and do somewhere else. Yeah, so that's why in the background you may hear some noise and stuff. You gotta ignore yeah. that. All good. My neighborhood is also quite noisy, so no stress. Okay. Yeah. Right, let's start with your journey, right? Uh, mm -hmm. I, I know you moved. I have watched uh, your little vlogs on YouTube a little bit. Mm -hmm. so I moved from Australia to. Uh, Germany. Can you just tell us how the process was and why you figured or felt like you had to move to Germany? Yeah, this is like the big thing. So um, I guess I had a choice after I finished high school. Mm -hmm. um, I couldn't, didn't really feel like I could pursue my sport in Australia. Um, so I figured if I was going to move my life anywhere, I had to choose sort of the best possible place to explore my sport and I found a few schools in Europe and this one in particular in Germany stood out to me. So I wasn't really choosing Germany, I was more choosing the school that I was training at. Okay. Um, yeah, and this particular coach, um, I guess if you want to be the best, surround yourself with the best. Um, he's known for having multiple world champions um, in his school and um, yeah, creating multiple world champions. And that was my goal. So I figured that's where I've got to move to, to be surrounded by that. Yeah. And yeah, I asked him if it was okay if I could come here to train. And he said, yeah, of course, when are you coming? And I was like, um, I kind of need to sort out my visa first and like <laughs> everything, like book a flight. I didn't know you would say yes so easily, but yeah, he was really welcoming for me. And then, yeah, then I got my paperwork sorted and I, I didn't really know if I was going to completely move yet. I only had a working holiday visa to start with. Mm -hmm. But, um, yeah, then I booked my flight and I was, yeah, I just, I came first day back. I went to training. So, yeah. <laughs> Did you uh, travel before, like outside the, uh, Australia before? Were you traveling a lot? Yes, yeah, so I was part of the national team in Australia for Taekwondo. Oh, okay. Yeah. And we did a few competitions. I had been to Singapore, um, but... I'd also had a World Cup, but that was held in Sydney. So even though it was international competition, it was like still in my home country. Yeah. Um, I think I'd been to Hawaii before that. And then I'd also been to Germany before for a world championship. Okay. 
So I did have a little bit of experience traveling and competing, but not to the extent that I have like after I moved. Yeah. So is Taekwondo your like primary sport? Is, is, that, is that how you, uh, I guess, categorize yourself as Taekwondo? Yeah, so I only did Taekwondo in Australia, but um, because we don't really have that many competitions in my sport, um, I wanted the availability to do kickboxing as well. Okay. So, like what I do is extremely niche, to be honest. It's only really popular in Europe, but okay. a lot of ITF Taekwondo competitors also do WACO kickboxing because they're quite similar yeah. and it gives you more competition exposure to be a better athlete. Yeah. So um, that's another reason why I chose this school because I had the opportunity to do both. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, so I do kickboxing and I'm in light contact and kick light. I can go into what those are if you like. Um, and then I also do ITF Taekwondo, which is just like its own sort of fight category with its own rules yeah. and things. Yeah. yeah. We'll get into that a little bit. Uh, I want to yeah. go even more further back to like growing up in Australia. Well, I watched I watched a lot of cricket, so I'm kind of like a little bit familiar with Australian and culture. Okay, yeah. Yeah, yeah cricket in Australia. Yeah. And it seems like a very like, like athletic like country in a sense a lot of people kind of I, I don't know from it seems like at least they're like really into sports and stuff growing up in Australia because I heard even now in I watch women's cricket a little bit and they're like the leading country in terms of that as well like they're like the yeah in cricket they're like the best women's team as well and a lot of the stories they seem like they're they have great backyard stories they play a lot they play a lot in backyard so I don't know how was your growing up in Australia and being like a, as, a, as like an athlete I guess yeah cricket was definitely huge in Australia it still is I mean yeah. I was playing cricket in my backyard with my brother and my dad yeah. so like, even though it I guess it's not our national sport because my background's Greek um yeah. just growing up in Australia we also have AFL football which yeah. is like our own sort of football yeah. um I was also playing that as a child but yeah like in primary school in high school sports were pushed especially swimming I guess because like we're near the coast so yeah. just keeping us safe when we're swimming in the water um, but yeah, like I tried all sorts of sports growing up in Australia. Um, I don't know, volleyball, football, soccer, or football, yeah. as you yeah. guys call it. Um, yeah, literally everything. Uh, I even got into ice skating. We had like an after school sports program and okay. had for a few weeks ice skating, and I got into that. So yeah, sports are pretty big, not just in Australia, but just yeah, like growing up, I was always playing them. And yeah. how did you end up? going towards taekwondo yeah so it's kind of i actually tried so many sports growing up so i started in ballet and dance when i was five mm -hmm. yeah and then i moved into jazz and then i moved into hip-hop so that was kind of me from i don't know five to eight years old yeah. or maybe yeah. even nine or ten but um i didn't really resonate with anyone in that community it was quite okay. feminine it was quite exclusive yeah. Um, and that wasn't really my personality. I didn't really have any sisters. I grew up with like a younger brother and two cousins. So it was kind of like always the only girl. Um, and then I tried gymnastics um, and then I did trampolining. <laughs> so like, again, the gymnastics community was quite feminine, quite exclusive. I didn't really learn as much as I expected to. Yeah. And then yeah, when I got to about 10 or 12 years old, um, I needed to change sports again and I really wanted to play soccer. Oh, but okay. my dad was like, no. I don't know why he said no. Yeah. He just said no. Yeah. And my auntie, who's his younger sister, I guess she'd grew up with her older brother always saying no. And oh, okay. she was just determined after that to be like, no, like you're gonna get your way. Mm. So um, she was doing Taekwondo at the time and she took me to one of her classes. Oh, okay. Um, and yeah, my dad obviously said no to that too, but like we just went. <laughs> and yeah, it was just like love at first sight. I don't know how else to explain it. <laughs> like instantly I felt connected. I felt welcomed. It was a kind of sport where like you didn't need like anyone else to practice. You can just kind of do it on your own. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I don't, I don't really don't know how to like explain to it. I feel like it just kind of connected with me automatically. Um, yeah. yeah. And I just I kept going to training. I was like so motivated, train every day, and I loved it. Yeah, yeah. born fighter. <laughs> yeah, I guess so. <laughs> and then I also want just get this is not like I guess not specific to you. I just want to know a little bit more about because Australia seems like it's a far away distance, distance land that we don't really know much about. So I want to know a little bit more about 
How yeah. was the high school experience there? High school experience, okay. Um, I went to an all girls school, so I'm a little bit niche, but um, yeah, you start school when you start high school when you're 13, and then you finish when you're 18. Um, so six years. Um, and yeah, you have a number of subjects as soon as you enter high school, at yeah. high school specifically or primary school as well. I well, know. I don't know. We call high school from we be, our high school is from ninth grade to twelfth grade over here in the U.S. Okay, and how old are you from ninth to twelfth? Uh, I would say from about fifteen to eighteen. Yeah, fourteen oh, okay. to eighteen. Yeah, I think I think I entered in as like a fourteen year old, but I was fifteen halfway through the year. Oh, okay. So your high school is only about three years. Four years. Nine, okay. nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. So we're in primary school from five till 12 and then we're in high school from 12 to 18 okay. and um basically from 12 to 18 you have uh like a set number of subjects every single year so mm -hmm. english maths science yeah. religion because i went to like a catholic school uh -huh. um and yeah, your day is basically just structured from two classes in the morning, recess, two classes in the afternoon, lunch, one class in the yeah. afternoon, and then you go home. And then, yeah, I guess sport and activities like, I don't know, carnivals, athletics, and all that yeah. sort of stuff in between. Yeah. Were you good at any in the school? Um, like academic? Yeah. Yeah, I was. Um, I didn't really feel like it at the time, but looking back, I definitely was. Yeah. Um, I really enjoyed learning. Um, yeah, I, yeah, I really enjoyed learning, studying. No, I'm, stuff. I'm asking because like I'm just thinking, curious about in terms of like, uh, I guess we speak from my perspective. Like, if I mm -hmm. were to choose something like a sport in order to move away from my country, uh, from from a different country, there will be like a little bit of from my family. There will be a little bit like holding back. Hey, what are you doing? Why, why not go be an engineer or something? So I'm like, I just want to know from your perspective, how was that like? Yeah. Like, Hundred percent. I mean, my dad really <laughs> struggled with the idea that he paid all this money for me to go to a private school for me to just sort of drop it all and move overseas for a sport. It was it was not expected. It was not accepted straight away. But um, the way that I saw it is, I would be sort of putting all my education to waste if I was to do something that I wasn't passionate about or just to know what I know about life, knowing that yeah. studying is always going to be there, but my young, youthful, motivated self isn't. Mm -hmm. So pursuing sport at a young age when I don't really, I didn't really know what sort of career I wanted to pursue into. It would yeah. have been just sort of following the crowd rather than mm -hmm. doing what I actually wanted to do. Yeah. So, um, yeah, definitely backlash from my parents, 100%. <laughs> but um, you just got to go for what you want, I guess. That's some bravery, though, to move to a different country, too, because I feel like, especially, I mean, I'm sure your parents just still will support you. Like, they will say stuff, but in, like, in the background, they will still probably, like, support you. Let's say you need some help over here in Germany, they probably still will support you, in a sense. But it is a little bit, I guess, more bravery, in a sense, when your parents, there's, there's, there's like, there just tends to be, like, a holding back, and you still push your, push your way through to a different country. I think that's still kind of inspiring, almost. Oh, okay. Yeah, I'm glad. <laughs> I mean, they didn't really support me in the sense of, like, telling me what to do. My yeah. whole dream was self-funded, self-researched, self-motivated. Yeah. They didn't really, I wouldn't say, understand my sport or yeah. sort of what I was going through as much as there was to understand. Do you know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. But, um, of course, they didn't, like, reject me after I left or wanted to leave. I'm yeah. still in that. I'm still... Yeah loved and valued but like in terms of getting everything done doing what i needed to do yeah. um finding a hostel finding the school finding the country mm -hmm. booking the flight everything was just yeah, yeah myself yeah that's great and then another thing i think i think it was on your instagram you said that you were a champion like a waco champion i believe yeah tell us a little about that from going from i guess a fresh start to becoming a champion yeah, this is crazy story, actually. Yeah. So I guess my main goal for moving was to become the athlete I thought I could be, so sort of reach my potential. Yeah. But over time you move, you compete more, you're surrounded by world champions. Mm -hmm. The highest 
level you can get in this sport is become a world champion. Yeah. So naturally, that became my goal, you know. Um, and it felt very, very far away, not yeah. only because of the resources that I had, but, um, yeah, just my own skills and abilities. Mm -hmm. It just comes um, straight away. Like, yes, I competed in the national team for Australia, but um, the skill gap between where I was compared to where my competitors and my teammates yeah. were was huge. Mm -hmm. like, I was not at the skill level that I am right now. Yeah. A lot of work that needed to get done. Um, so, yeah, when I first moved, I was basically like training twice per day. Um, no one really understood it, but I understood my skill gap and where I needed to be. Yeah. And that it required a lot of work. And honestly, like, I started to win more towards the start of this year mm -hmm. um, because I dropped weight classes. So I was originally in a higher weight class, which means a lot of my opponents were quite bigger. Yeah. But I dropped weight classes. So then I was finding people more my size and I started to see more wins coming through. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I'd competed like every single month or even every single week. June, I competed like every yeah. single month. <laughs> Just in Germany, it was in another country as well. Yeah. So I went to Amsterdam, I was in Germany, and then this I had this World Cup in Budapest, and it was my last one before yeah. my next competition, which is next weekend. Okay. Yeah. So, thank you. <laughs> but, um, yeah, like, I was competing every weekend, and I wasn't, like, I was winning, but I didn't expect to win a World Cup. Okay. I, essentially burnt out before this competition. Um, okay. I didn't really understand where I was going. I was like, I'm not going to win. Um, it doesn't really feel like it's worth it. I'm yeah. just wasting all this money and time when like I really need to get back and like start building my personal brand so I can sustain this fighting career because like it's unpaid. Yeah. So um, I really wanted to just get back, start working, start working on my personal brand and like keep longevity going. Yeah. And then, yeah, just randomly, I just, I started, I had like the most fights I've ever had in my entire career. Mm -hmm. So usually I fight two to three times per day. In this day, I fought seven times. Oh um, yeah, like I had seven fights. I won six of them. Yeah. And um, yeah, in my second category, I won all fights to gold. So oh, nice. I'm winning the competition. <laughs> <laughs> without even expecting it like yeah. you expect to feel fully prepared fully ready yeah um, fully supported like nutrition strength and conditioning psychology like a whole team behind you yeah. but i was like alone uncertain confused <laughs> and i just yeah. won the whole thing it was so emotional yeah, yeah. And, and i want to know more about it too like yeah. obviously it's a physical support so there's a there's a physical i guess development that's need to be done but I want to know more about the mental side and even more like the spiritual side as well, I'm guessing, because it is quite, I think, spiritual experience to be in a ring with somebody else and be able to fight with them. So I just want to know a little bit about how that process, what, what helps you kind of uh, improve on that side of the training? Um, like my spirituality or just like the mentality of being in the ring? Um, I would say both. You could, you could go through both of them, I guess. Yeah, so I guess my confidence in my own abilities wasn't as high as you'd probably expect a top competitor to be. Yeah. I didn't really have a lot of faith that I would win the competition. Um, but it was very much a fake it till you make it sort of situation. Uh, yeah. Um, I do invest a, invest a lot in my mental um, capabilities in the ring. Mm -hmm. um, because, yeah, it is quite confronting, I guess, to yeah. have a good heart as a person, but then walk into a ring and try and punch someone or kick someone in the face and hurt yeah. them and yeah. scare them so that you're dominating. Yeah. But, um, yeah, I think I really tried to separate myself from who I was compared to who I needed to be okay. in this competition. So I would say to myself, my only goal isn't to win, it's to have this sort of lion mentality. And it was just... Um, don't fight, like, just fight how, fight like the fighter you would want to see, yeah. or fight like the fighter you would want to be. Yeah. You don't have to feel like you're that person, but you just have to put on this persona. And kind of just by faking it, a few, like, 30 seconds into the fight, I became that person, and I was completely disconnected from that. But 
it allowed me to, I guess, you know, yeah. embody the mental state and the performance of a champion or like a really, really good fighter. So yeah. yeah, that was one like really big shock for me, but I really think it carried me through. Does that, I think, does that translate to life as well to have that spirit like if you have i guess if you're faced with obstacles perhaps you have that i guess to draw from your background in fighting rather uh emotional and mental side or toughness side from you can, you can take forward in life as well yeah 100 percent. there are so many um realizations or connections that i make between fighting and between my life um I can't really think of any on the top of my head like conveniently. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, but um, just the whole idea of training hard, pushing through, um, not everything is as it seems. You can't really trust the way that you feel. Yeah. Um, and then just seeing how things come about despite yeah. how you feel about them. I feel like maybe that's not the best way to describe it, but... Uh, Definitely, like I've been through quite a few tough times, obviously moving countries, being on my own. Um, I draw a lot of my faith and strength from God. I'm Christian, so I pray a lot. I'm Greek Orthodox, like I go to church quite often. I really feel the presence of God throughout my work and throughout my life. Mm -hmm. So when I'm deep in the struggles and tough times, yeah. which happens quite frequently, I feel like with God and like a higher power yeah. really brings me back to earth and things in my life just magically seem to sort of become bearable yeah. or you know work out mm -hmm. um yeah I assume it might be the same for you um yeah, yeah. in terms of religion spirituality like yeah. some sort of yeah I also noticed that's actually kind of like common, like a lot of, I don't want to say they're true religious, but there's actually, some, religious is a way as well. A lot of athletes tend to have, like top athletes tend to have this foundation in religion. I mean, one of the examples, like, I don't know if you're familiar with her, is uh, Sydney McLaughlin, I think. She's a 400 meter uh, hurdles champion for the US. She was in the last Olympics. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, even she's like, she talks about it quite uh, consistently as well, about her faith as well. And there's mm -hmm. something that I noticed that a lot of top athletes tend to have that faith or some, I guess, source of focus in their life. And another thing I wanted to ask was when you were fighting and you say you have to have the lion mentality, when do you, I guess, turn it off? Like, is it right after you've done fighting that person? Like, how does it, when, you, when does that turn off? Yeah, it turns on as soon as you step on the ring and essentially after you're done. Yeah, it turns off. Um, I'm always, I think, experience helps a lot when you're fighting um at the start i felt like i needed to hate my opponent and i needed to really look down on them in order to sort of dominate them in the ring mm -hmm. but when i took a step back and sort of saw it more of a competition um and yeah it has nothing to do with the person that you're fighting it's more just you kind of enter this state when you're in the ring mm -hmm. and it's entirely about the competition and expressing your skills and abilities expressing the sport it's nothing personal. Yeah. Um, and if anything, you're doing the sport and the other person disservice by not bringing your best self to the table. Yeah. Like when you enter this sort of space, you want competition, you want to be pushed, yeah. you need it. And it's not only exciting for you and you feel the growth, but it's exciting for the viewer and the audience. Like you owe it to them to be able to like express the best part yeah. of yourself. And it's entirely separate from who you are. Like, as soon as you step off that mat, like, you give, like, there's really good sportsmanship. You shake hands. You give each other a hug. You say thank you. Like, yeah. thank you for giving me this experience. Thank you for being a good competition. Because yeah. if you're in competition with someone that's not that great and you just, like, completely obliterate them, mm -hmm. it comes to a point where it's, like, did you really, like, win? Do you know what I mean? But it really yeah. feels like a win when, like, you're both sort of at the same level and mm -hmm. then you both kind of, like, inching yeah. get the better of each other. And I feel like that's where the real win is. So just being able to thank someone for meeting you at that level and being able to push each other both to go higher, yeah. I think it's also, like, a really big part of the sport. And, yeah. Can you sense, like, right when you step in the ring, can you sense this is going to be a tough opponent or is it going to be, like, an easy win or can you sense that? Yeah, you can, <laughs> for the most part, yeah. But 
the good thing about this is I don't know about every other opponent. I mean, like other people when they fight, but I know personally, if I know that maybe someone stepping in the ring, they don't have as much experience as me, or um, maybe they're not as good, I yeah. won't just go in there and completely like destroy them to prove a point. Um, for me, it's not worth it. Like yeah. I'll do what I need to do to win, but I don't need to hurt them. Does yeah. that make sense? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, because, yeah, for example, like my first round in my tournament in June, um, I had someone that wasn't as experienced. And honestly, like the whole time I was just looking at her, I was like, you are so beautiful. I can't hurt yeah. you. Do you know what I mean? Like I do what I need to do to win and I get my points and I show that I'm the dominant person in the ring. Yeah. But outside of that, like you don't need to like hurt and completely destroy. It's like, it's not honorable in that sense. Yeah. And that is unique. I think a um, lot, lot of time you watch MMA or you watch boxing here, there tends to be a lot of anima animosity even outside the, like, I know this this part of it is show biz as well. They want to show, like, the the, the, the cause of the drama. But that's mm -hmm. interesting that even in the U.S., even in other sports, that's something that I've been slightly disappointed in it here, even if it's like tennis or any of those, or tennis is not so much, but other sports, the animosity is almost promoted. Like, the people that watch or the people that, uh, even like our coaches, they want to have the animosity even outside of the the sport itself. So even like let's say you, you meet the team outside the before the, like the bus is coming and the, like you, you cross paths with them, they want you to almost hate them at that moment. Mm -hmm. I think that's like quite beautiful that like even the sport that's designed on hitting somebody and like mm -hmm. like hurting them, that has like a lot more respect towards their opponent than a sport. Even the sport that doesn't like it's, it's, only, it's only skill like I play basketball, so it's only skill based sport. I mean there's physicality but not that much. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I find it quite interesting that a very physical sport is a lot more respectful for their opponents than we are over here. Yeah, yeah, it's actually a really interesting point. I, even Muay Thai, like people bow to each other, they thank each other, they have yeah. their own ritual before their fights. So yeah, I mean, this is just my own personal experience. I think there is some animosity between fighters. They can be naturally, yeah. but um, like you know, even light sort of thing, just banter but as sort of like a joke or just to yeah. bring the fun out of it. But yeah, as you said, also in show business, it's the kind of thing that grabs attention. Oh. A lot of, if you, if you want to grab the biggest audience, you have to appeal to people that aren't even interested yeah. in sport. So if you're not appealing to the interest of sport, everyone sort of turns their head when someone's yeah. having an argument and someone's flipping a table, someone's yeah. like standing face to face with someone and getting angry. They're like, oh, what's going on here? Like, why are yeah. they doing it grab it naturally grabs attention yeah. and attention's where the money's at so yeah. it makes a lot of sense but you're right it is unfortunate because um yeah it's kind of like it makes it so animalistic and primitive in my opinion yeah. <laughs> whereas like yeah it can just be a skill game it can just be like a showcase of what like humans are capable of outside yeah. of like like we're more than that i think yeah and how much I want to go into a little bit of like you said everything you do is almost self-funded right and i want to like just know like what's the future for taekwondo like we don't hear too much about it like i wasn't mm -hmm. i heard a name but i wasn't too familiar how the sport works or anything so what do you yeah. see the future but do you see the sport growing do you see where athletes can be able to like support themselves financially how far away is that i guess yeah so we have <laughs> we have taekwondo but it was separated into sort of two separate uh sports you mm -hmm. have um, WTF Taekwondo, which is World Taekwondo, yeah. and this is in the Olympics. I'm assuming because this version of Taekwondo is in the Olympics, it's also more funded. Um, so you can essentially become professional, become part of a national team, etc. Yeah. Unfortunately, I entered into the non funded, less okay. popular version of Taekwondo. Yeah. My opinion is much more exciting, but it okay. is how it is. Yeah. Um, there's the problem is there's so much politics associated with my sport that it's hard to predict whether it's going to grow or become funded. Um, in some countries, it's bigger than others as well. We're separated into, even though we're one sport, we're separated into like 20 separate federations in oh, each with yeah. their own set. Yeah. So it's really hard to see sort of that uniting. Yeah. But I'm part of one of the bigger federations right now, and I can say that I wouldn't say that it's there's a chance that it's going to get funded anytime in the near future. Okay. Um, there are definitely countries like Spain, 
um, Argentina, mm -hmm. potentially Russia, I'm not too sure, okay. um, that do fund people who play the sport, or oh, Poland as well. Um, right. The national teams are quite big and their selection criteria is also quite strenuous, so you can assume that there's yeah. like, like, high demand for the sport there. Um, I'm lucky in my sport, this is another reason why I moved to Germany, that even though I have to pay for my own competitions, they're mm. basically 75% compensated, so I only have to pay 25% okay. of the cost, whereas people from other countries would have to pay 100% of the cost. Yeah. Competition fees, sparring gear, yeah. like Joe Block, um, travel, accommodation, yeah. everything. So a lot of that is funded for me, being part of the national team, which is... Yeah really good yeah um yeah but in terms of funding for our sport you have to look externally unfortunately there's nothing we don't really have the type of audience or sponsors that fund the athletes okay yeah and obviously uh, you started a little bit you creating your own brand you kind of grown a lot on, on social media recently as well yeah. uh, so talk a little about that how is How's that process been? And uh, you, you recently also started giving lessons as well. So talk, talk a little bit about that. Yeah, sure. So I had a lot of savings, like moving to Germany. I had yeah. like a pretty good job in Australia. I lived with my parents and I was pretty comfortable moving overseas because I sort of had the financial cushion. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I kind of felt that because of my skill gap, I needed to train quite mm -hmm. frequently. Yeah. And also just with the frequency of competitions, being prepared, staying injury free, sleeping enough, eating the right things. Um, I decided that I, it wasn't even too much of a decision because I was also considering my visa okay. and there were different options for me being able to stay here. So I could study, I could work, I could babysit. I was also exploring these options. Um, so I didn't just jump into work straight away because I wanted to prioritize training. Mm -hmm. And I was under the impression that working at a cafe or working at a hotel or working at a bar wouldn't grant me a visa. Mm -hmm. So although maybe these jobs would give me money, they wouldn't allow me to stay long-term. So I was really looking for like a long-term solution so I wouldn't have to move back. And that was really difficult actually. Um, there's not much work that you can do, especially in Germany, without an ed like a higher education. I finished high school, but I didn't go to university, so I couldn't really um, just get like sort of a recognized job for yeah. a visa. Yeah. Um, and then looking at studying, I would have to study. I would have to work to support myself while I study, and then I didn't see myself having any time to really prioritize yeah. training. So that didn't seem like an option because it was contrary to my goal. Yeah. And then I was also competing during this time. So I was trying out different options and I was also competing. So it was definitely a balancing act. Um, I tried babysitting in December, but it didn't really work out with the time frames. Um, so that didn't really work out. And yeah, I just sort of saw social media as an opportunity to express my art. Mm -hmm. grow a following and potentially attract a sponsor and had that sort of as my funding. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, again, influencing seemed easy when I first tried it, but yeah. it's a lot harder than what people probably first expect. Yeah. It kind of just it's like people post a photo of their life and post a cute little video and have this nice aesthetic grid, like profile yeah. grid, but so much work really goes into these profiles, into attracting yeah. attention, especially nowadays. Um, when like so many more people are trying to become an influencer, it just becomes yeah. more competitive. Um, so yeah, uh, that sort of was my motivation, the fact that no visa solution really worked and I needed a financial solution. And I saw mm -hmm. influencing and brand deals and sort of making money through growing an audience um, that way. And yeah, that was my motivation to see like, how do you grow a following? How do you like make a video yeah. do well? And um, yeah, that was my motivation to grow my following. And, and what about uh, the teaching lessons as well? You started, right? Yeah, personal training. So um, I have like quite a few people around me doing personal training. Yeah. And I guess now that I've won a world title, it's a sort of flexible way that I can 
fund myself and still be able to train and compete. Yeah. Um, yeah, I've had like a few personal training lessons and they've gone well, but it also, it's like quite new. I don't really have too much experience in it. Yeah. Um, I've kind of just done the sport, but I haven't really gone as far as to teach it to someone. Yeah. So I feel like teaching is like a sort of separate aspect as well. Yeah. So getting it off the ground is sort of like time, money, resources that take away from training and competing. Yeah. But it's something that um, I want to start because I think I would enjoy it and it could fund what I'm trying to do. But um, yeah. And uh, I was wanna curious, like I think you mentioned it on on your social media that you do you are open to training in like virtually as well. But yeah. I also wanna know like how you think that that's a possibility for long term sustainability. Because I know the people in the U.S. they they are quite interested in sports, martial arts, and stuff like that. But mm-hmm. it's like possible for them to get personal training. It would it be effective doing it virtually? Yeah, hundred percent. I think the biggest thing that I could have had before I moved to Germany is like a mentor. Mm -hmm. Um, I was training on my own for two years with absolutely no guidance. Mm -hmm. Uh, Like I had my coach from Australia, but I wouldn't say that they were as in touch with the competition scene that I'm currently competing in. And my skills could have been so much more further along just if I had someone there to tell me how to train, what to eat, what to focus on. Yeah. I see a lot of new people come into the gym and I think especially for martial arts, it's quite daunting when you have zero skill set going into people who have much higher skill set and you're trying to practice while everyone around you is quite above you. I definitely felt that self-consciousness when I first walked in, like people watching you, people judging your fight moves. And I think, you know, if you walk into a gym and you're on the phone with someone who's telling you what to do and telling you to feel confident about it, I think that's definitely valuable, you know? Yeah. I could definitely say I started from zero in terms of my training and there yeah. are just aspects of my training, just little details that yeah. you don't think are really a big deal can yeah. really make a difference to your training progress. So yeah. you don't have to be in person to get those that information. You can be online, you can be, you know, you're still present and yeah. watching. Yeah. And do you like, uh, you know, you know, you said you mentioned earlier that it was not as big in Australia, the sport. Do you ever have like a plan of going back and starting like, I guess, academy there or something like that? Make it promote the sport? <laughs> yeah, a lot of people ask me that. Um, I think, yeah, pursuing my sport didn't really have any like long term open up my school, become a coach sort of thing. I definitely enjoy training people and helping people get better because I remember what it was like to want to be better but not know how. Yeah. So just giving someone that advice is like it's really rewarding to say like you know I can give this forward um but as um I mentioned earlier like in school I was quite academic I'm also quite interested in other things I'm interested in business I'm interested in pursuing other areas of life um pursuing sport basically means you have to cancel out every single other area of your life including sometimes friends and family food um you know parties going out um and yeah, it's really hard to sort of educate yourself or focus on other areas to excel. So I think because I'm naturally interested in like so many different things, I would want to explore other things and yeah. still train, still yeah. stay fit. I don't think I could ever give up fighting, but um, definitely like look into other things. I don't think I would, yeah. It's getting quite dark in here. I'm gonna turn the light, but yeah. Have you started looking at other things right now? Are you like look, studying or anything like that on the side? Um, I do sort of try to stay educated in some sort of sense. Well, I, think, I think that that's how we initially uh, communicate. I think you were looking for books recommendation, I believe. Initially, yeah. Potentially. I don't okay. know. I think, I think I think that's where I think you posted some book that I was like, oh, that's interesting. I, I don't know what it was, but you, you were into reading a lot. Yeah, I follow this like book Instagram page, book page on Instagram that yeah. I really like. It's kind of like a quick way to read a book, but not actually read a whole book. But yeah, I like reading. Um, uh, yeah, you were you you were thinking you to, at the time you wanted to learn programming, or you also you also wanted to learn German. Have you like succeeded in any any of those? Or either of those. Yeah. <laughs> Um, the thing is, I was really into French in high school. I also learned Greek, 
Okay. So when I came to Germany, I don't know, I just, my capacity or my appetite for language learning was not as high. <laughs> yeah. And I just, I wasn't really motivated to learn. Also, the only motivation to learn was kind of to get a job here, which wasn't really my interest. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I've managed to passively learn the language, basically, just by living here, having yeah. everyone speak. My Taekwondo lessons are in German. Um, I recently just had, like, an entire conversation just in German. Okay. Um, and that was entirely through passive learning, just from living okay. here yeah. and hearing people speak. Um, yeah, so I think, like, 10% of the language that actually you used only 10% of like all of the language that actually yeah. exists. Makes so sense, like yeah. good morning, how are you? Um, even like general day-to-day -day conversation, yeah. it's pretty much like the same, but just in another language. So it's really easy to translate. Personally, yeah. that's what I find anyway. Um, so even though there's hundreds and thousands of words that you can learn in another yeah. language, there's only maybe 10% of it that's actually yeah. used in conversation. So when you put it in that perspective, um, yeah, it's much easier to learn a language. Yeah. So just like exist <laughs> and just have it downloaded, yeah. Yeah. And also uh, you mentioned you're training a lot, like twice a day almost, and or maybe more. And one thing when I play sport as well, like organized sports, is that yes, physically draining, yes, but that's also mentally quite draining, right? Like when you physically get tired, you mentally tend to get tired a lot too. You don't want to get up in the morning. You don't want to go to training on Saturdays or weekends. How was that process like? How do you overcome that? I know you, that's like, it's your passion. You want to follow it. But even if, it's, even if it is your passion, it still gets quite difficult to get up and go to training. So how is that? How, does that, how do you get through that? A thousand percent. Um, I actually have like a little note here. I can bring it up. It's okay. called, um, like, I write, like, different things in my notes, and this note is called um, training when you don't feel like it. I actually wrote it down. But it's essentially, like, just putting coins in the jar, essentially. Like, okay. you don't really think that one small training session will make a big impact, but it will. Yeah. Um, also, like, the discipline of staying consistent and sort of doing things even when you don't feel like it. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sort of under the impression that you can only have one thing at a time. So if you have one goal, then all of your actions can kind of, like, narrow down into this one goal. Yeah. And it's kind of easier to ignore your feelings at one point in time because... Yeah whatever decision you make has to like support that goal. So let's just say if my goal is to become a world champion, it doesn't matter that like, you know, when I wake up in the morning, I don't feel like training, like my goal is to be a world champion. So you just follow that path. Yeah, um, but I definitely resonate with the mental struggle. Um, mm -hmm. Getting myself to training every day it takes like an hour. I have to take the train, I have to walk. Yeah. And it gets quite tiring doing that every single day. But when I warm up, um and get into training then i'm i'm switched on i'm motivated it's more just about actually getting myself in that space but yeah i also find it's quite mentally draining when i'm coming back home because obviously there's other areas of my life that i need to focus on yeah. and mental capacity after you've trained <laughs> your heart out is basically zero yeah you have that experience but it's really hard to pull yourself together when like physically yeah Especially when you have to like focus on diet, and you have. I think recently you were also on a cut. I think that's had a like, mental effect as well, being on a cut, not having yeah. in your body. Okay, my light is moving. Yeah, that's another really huge thing. So, um, I use a lot of caffeine to help me. Um, oh my god, this is moving. Sorry. Um, it's like so dark in here. I don't know why, Germany. Um. <laughs> why? Yeah. Uh, yeah, so I really like uh, drinking coffee, yeah. but I've stopped drinking it so that I can perform better for my competition. Yeah. Um, and also, yeah, I can't eat. Usually when you're studying, you like to have, like, some snacks or some, yeah. like, you know, things on the side to help move you along, yeah. to help motivate you. Or, like, you know, I'm going to do this piece of work and then I'm going to reward myself with a pizza with friends afterwards. I don't really have that luxury, which makes things 20 times as difficult, to be honest. Yeah. But um, yeah, I guess there's a discipline to that, and by the end of it, as um, yeah, it's like a happiness reset for me. 
So like you're bringing yourself back down to zero essentially. Like when you're going through a weight cut, you go through this phase. So first you cut out carbs and then you cut out fiber and then you cut out food and then all you have is water. And I just remember like in my last weight cut, I was in the sauna and I was like completely dehydrated, hadn't eaten anything. I was just lying there and I was like, thank God I can breathe. <laughs> I just, I, I'd stripped myself of so many luxuries that I was yeah. just infinitely grateful for breath. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, but it really gets to that point. I have a question right here from uh, my producer. He sent me a question real quick. Okay. He said, uh, oh, actually, I can ask a question. He said that you mentioned earlier about uh, you not. Uh, going to other other trainings, no, other trainings like too feminine. You you didn't want to be part of like that, like ballet, like ballet, for example. You mentioned earlier, is has there ever been like I guess a drawback in a sense where people have said fighting is like maybe you're not, you're not feminine enough, or because I'm asking this from like a perspective of girls training in sports. A lot of times they've kind of been held back in a sense, or oh, they're not like feminine enough, or then then not being. I guess you could say that they're not feminine. Enough. Have you ever encountered that? How you deal with that kind of aspect? Okay, yeah. Um, In my personal life, I've never had someone tell me girls can't fight, fighting super girls, or like, you know, it's always been positive responses. Oh, you're a kickboxer. Oh, you could beat me up. Oh, I'm scared. You know what I mean? Like, there's never been any sort of backlash with my gender. But as soon as I started posting on TikTok, I realized that a lot of videos went viral when I started talking about, um, like, being a woman and fighting there was a there was a huge topic so i don't know maybe it's more of a topic in america yeah but um yeah i've never experienced like sh- like feeling um outcasted from being yeah. a girl in sport or being a girl in martial arts um the one thing i can say though is i am the only girl yeah. <laughs> in training okay. i'm the only girl when i go to the, the gym yeah. in the morning i'm surrounded by guys and yeah. I'm the only girl in the gym when I go to the evening. I'm pretty much on my own in the locker room. Yeah. Being girls come in and out of my training, but I'm pretty much the only girl, the only time, like all the time. Yeah. And um, it makes sense, I guess. Um, it is a, more of a masculine sport. Yeah. Um, but I don't think it means that you can't be feminine and play the sport. Exactly. Especially in the categories that I play, in kickboxing, in UFC, in like sort of more brutal martial arts, I can see where the misconception sort of comes from because yeah. as you sort of get more brutal and more forceful, you have to become bigger, you have to be, have yeah. strong muscles, you're kind of yeah. like competing for strength rather than skill. But I really feel like in the sports that I'm playing at, it's a skill game. Yeah. If anything, it's more beneficial to be a girl because um, flexibility is a huge part of both of my sports. And yeah. naturally women are more flexible than guys. Yeah. So if you see the way that like women are able to like lift their leg and kick yeah. and throw things so effortlessly, mm-hmm. whereas like sometimes guys, they can't even like spread their legs more than 90 degrees because they're just yeah. like, flexible. Um, but yeah, like, there's definitely like a feminine side to the sport that I can see through. And yeah. there's been so many girls that have maintained their femininity, their long hair, their, you know, sort of feminine aura, but still be in, in the fight. And yeah. Yeah. And that's, that's what I wanted to kind of get into as well. Like I feel like a lot of um, girls don't tend to get into sports because they don't want, well, that's what kind of, I guess there's a stigma as well from, from, like, from society as well, but that's the biggest thing I always try to uh, get is that a lot of the limits that are put on uh, women as athletes is tend to be like society based, not 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 not. I guess I would say like biologically based. I guess they're more so like like there's pressures on them to be a certain way, and I think you'd be a great example in a sense. You like you have you kept your femininity, but you also like being, you were also like a pretty brutal like sport as well. Like compared to any other sport around around going around, so that's like the biggest thing. Even like you don't see as many girls being involved in sports in general. Like you said, you're the only girl in your sport as well. So that's another thing yeah. I want, really want to emphasize that it's okay to be an athlete and you can still be a feminine or do other things as well. Yeah. And I think it's a really big shame that like girls aren't pushed more in school. I mean, I even remember in primary school, so many yeah. girls would use like their period as an excuse to not participate. And I think it's just not having that mentor or not having that sort of push 
or example of like a woman being in that same situ- situation and saying, hey, actually, like you can do this and you should yeah. because it's just sport. It's like getting into exercise as well. Like yeah. guy, girl, whatever you are, like yeah. you should be exercising, you should be moving. It's not a feminine or masculine thing. It's yeah. part of an experience. Our bodies are made for movement. Mm-hmm. Um, but naturally i do think i have more of a masculine personality growing up Mm -hmm. with guys or just being sort of like the oldest sibling so i guess there is like a little bit of a bias there too i do have quite like a strong personality i think um and i'm not really as intimidated easily and as i get further along in my sport and i gain more confidence i gain more masculine sort of traits just naturally but um i don't think it means that if you're more of a feminine person or have more feminine qualities that entering a martial art is anything bad or anything that can take away from it. I think you can only get to it and anything give you more balance. Um, Yeah. yeah. Like anyone on either end of the spectrum should seek to do things on the other side, just to sort of maintain that equilibrium. Yeah. Yeah. And another thing I want to, I guess, explore is uh, you mentioned you were, uh, your past is from like your Greek, as well mm-hmm. so yeah. i want you know, i think uh i want to know how like how much do you like uh how much do you visit greece and how is that side of your family and how does like god greece is also another one of those tourist destinations that everybody wants to go to but we never get a chance <laughs> that's why i know yeah. that, oh, how's that how has that experience been yeah so even though i grew up in australia my background and my family is greek so i grew up going to church every weekend yeah. i grew up um, celebrating big Greek celebrations, Christmas, Easter. I mean, they're Christian celebrations, but I celebrated them how they would have been celebrated in Greece, for example, especially like before my grandpa, my grandparents migrated. Mm-hmm. Um, unfortunately, I never got the chance to go to Greece um, in my early childhood. My It's quite a far distance from Australia to Greece, so the flight can be quite expensive, taking whole family there, taking time off work, that sort of thing. It's like... It's not exactly an easy thing to do yeah. for most families. Yeah, but um, I was lucky enough to go with my brother this summer and we got to experience like what it was finally like, like the culture yeah. and everything. Uh, it's definitely different. Um, a lot of migrants sort of hold the preconceived uh, notions, values and beliefs from when they first left their country yeah. and sort of held that in a new place while the other place was still developing and growing. Does that make sense? Yeah. But, um, yeah, I guess like any migrant, you're like half the place that you grew up in and half the place back home that you don't really find yourself fully part of any of them. You're just kind of like this place in between. But um, I don't think that's just a Greek experience. I think that's like with a lot of people now, like people migrate into different countries, growing up in different places. But, Yeah. um, yeah, I still consider myself Greek and... I still acknowledge that a lot of my personality, a lot of yeah, you know, my traditions, my religion, it comes from, you know, where my grandparents are from, and I'm like quite proud of that. Yeah. So yeah. Do you also cook Greek food? Yeah, I do. Uh, I guess I even have like an influence the way that I cook, the way that I eat, the foods that I gravitate towards. I'm a very heavy meat eater. <laughs> That's definitely my like the Greek yeah. side of me. Yeah. So, yeah. And you mentioned like going to Greece with your brother recently as well. So it's like a like a little break for you. And I want to go back to uh, Taekwondo or fighting in general. Is that mm-hmm. break like you felt like it was it a more necessary physically or was it like a mentally more necessary break? That you, I mean, even not, not not in this case, but in general, when you take breaks off from your uh, training. Is that more of a mental break that's more needed at times or was it more of a physical break that you're taking? It was an unplanned break, to be honest. I okay. haven't seen my brother in over a year and a half and yeah. he just kind of booked the flight. And I'm kind of coming to the point now where I really want to grow my personal brand to financially support myself. And uh, I really felt like this was a risky break to take, especially because I've got world championships next week. And... I didn't really feel like I was sort of honoring that by going on sort of like a vacation with my brother so close to this competition. Yeah, um, yeah every time you travel, it really doesn't like fail to sort of uplift yeah. your spirit and everything. Like it's definitely like a rejuvenation. Mm-hmm. Um, naturally, you come back to training more motivated, 
or at least that's what I felt, mm -hmm. um, seeing a new place. And I feel like just like, you know, I have a very, really, I have a very rigid routine and really strict regimen living here in Germany. I kind of see yeah. the same places every day. I have the same routine. So anytime I'm taken outside of that and brought back in, I can really appreciate the place that I've been in, like having the piece of a routine. And then I also, also can really appreciate something different, something new, yeah. and it really like rejuvenates me. So yeah, it's definitely a mental break. It's definitely a physical break. Yeah. Um, yeah. The physical break was quite challenging because being on vacation, I put on yeah. a little bit of weight naturally. So the weight yeah. cutting in was quite difficult and being away from training, trying to get back into fitness. Um, I think my performance at the next competition is going to say really how much of an effect this sort of had on me. Yeah. But, um, yeah, I'm still, like, it was still extremely enjoyable. I was grateful that I could spend some time with my brother. Yeah, um, yeah like, you don't really want to pass up those opportunities because you never really know what's going to happen. So. Yeah. And do you also, like, plan, how far ahead do you, like, look at yourself? Like, do you look at yourself, okay, I'm, I'm, I want to be here in five years, or, or, you, or you try to stay in present as much as you possibly can? How do you, like, plan your, like, it's, I don't want to say life, but in terms of your goals, mm -hmm. how do you plan that? Yeah. So I definitely want to exploit my youth. Um, I really want to, my idea of living in the present moment is sort of defining what you think. Um, living, for example, like, now in my 20s, um I just have to define what making the most out of my 20s looks like mm -hmm. when you're 20 what are you like you're young you're fit you're healthy you have like yeah. a really good mind you have time um so making decisions around finances and like long-term like planning sort of thing about like trying to stay secure and safe I just really don't feel like it's the time mm -hmm. um I feel like if you're making those sort of decisions when you're young what you're like making make or break decisions like trying to choose a career that you're going to do for the rest of your life or yeah. to, like you know start a family that you're going to have for the rest of your life when you're starting that too early I feel like you're not really making the most of the present moment which is yeah. like, you know, your youth and your time so I definitely see my like see my current situation as an opportunity to play my sport yeah and probably within the next few years um I still have goals within my skills that I want to reach even mm -hmm. though i've like one sort of a world title um i still see gaps in my skills yeah. gaps in my mentality gaps in you know places that i can like fully um yeah. explore my potential yeah and then yeah i probably towards like the end of my 30s that's maybe when i'll start to draw back and not train um as much like not train twice per day not take sports so seriously yeah. um not that there's anything wrong with taking sport seriously at that age, but I don't see sport as a job. I see something as like me exploring my passion and I see something that I do for money. Mm -hmm. Actually, to be honest, like I never really want to do anything purely for money. Like yeah. I really see like a world that we live in that, you know, you can help contribute towards and work in like, how can I help people? What can I do to like, progress? I don't really want to see money as ever like, uh, part of my decision making process if that yeah. makes sense yeah um so yeah like when I get older I just want to focus on like different ways that I can help the world when I'm still exploring my interests and stuff and yeah I do see myself sort of taking a step down from sport but definitely not a step away yeah coming to the last few questions and the one is that what kind of advice would you like to give to like another 18 year old that's like let's just say he's playing cricket in the backyard or playing soccer or even in the U.S. Mm -hmm. where they're playing basketball, what kind of yeah. advice would you like to give? Even an artist, perhaps, that anything that's, like, I guess, out of the normal path, what kind mm -hmm. of advice would you like to give to that person? How do, you, how do you approach that, the career? Yeah, like advice as in, like, they want to pursue their sport, they want to pursue yeah. their career passions. Yeah. Um, yeah, start posting on Instagram, start posting on TikTok, start <laughs> expressing yourself to the public and yeah. gain an audience for what you want to do. Um, and, yeah... It's really hard, admit that it's really hard to pass that first barrier. Like you're yeah. gonna have your family and friends as your first followers. So bringing the phone to your face and saying, hey guys, welcome to my vlog. Or like, you know, yeah. it's kind of embarrassing when you just have your mom watching, but <laughs> just keep doing it. <laughs> I can definitely relate to <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, just keep, like it's embarrassing, but 
like you only live one life people in like a million years aren't going to remember it yeah it's just like you've got to zoom out so far out like we are a blink in space and time yeah. sort of thing. like think about how i just think like the benefits outweigh the yeah. negative so much more so yes yeah, start doing that early like swallow your pride and just get it done and definitely explore that creative side of you because this might be the only time that you can do it in your entire life you yeah. know like you're not going to be able to play soccer the same way that you are when you're 20 compared to when you're 40. So, yeah, really make the most use of that time because even if you can't see what your life's going to look like when you're 40, like you definitely know that, I don't know, just, yeah, take advantage of the fact that it's like a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity and just know that, yeah. yeah. And then finally, this is a question I'd, I'd like to ask. It's like slightly off topic. It's the... Uh, what are the top things that you'd like to entertain yourself with? Any top three books you've read or movies or what kind of music? Actually, yeah, I want to ask, what kind of music do you listen, listen to pre going into the trade uh, in the ring? So what mm-hmm. kind of uh, stuff, you, any suggestions you want to give out to the audience? Yeah. So uh, it's actually taken me a really long time to relax. Yeah. Um, I kind of confused work and productivity really frequently. So mm-hmm. I think... It's actually a sum. I think productivity equals work plus rest rather than productivity equals work. So I was definitely on overdrive in terms of work. I would never allow myself to rest and kind of found myself sort of like not being able to do anything, just kind of sitting there idle, just lying down because I was just yeah. entirely burnt out. And I couldn't understand why I couldn't do anything, but I definitely think it's an equation and rest is part of that. So I have been trying to sort of allow myself more opportunities to activate my um, parasympathetic nervous system, just like relax. Um, Just seeing friends is a really good way to do that. And like, just like, I don't know, hang out after training, for example, usually an opportunity I would skip because I know I got to go home and do work, but I see the value in those opportunities now. Um, just doing things for the sake of doing them, creative things like going on a walk, drawing, um, just like take an afternoon to get a coffee or go for a walk or just do some shopping or I don't know, just anything that takes you out of your day-to-day routine because even though it feels like you're taking yourself away from your work, if you're a workaholic, you're actually bringing yourself closer to your work because every single time I've gone to see a friend or I've done something outside of my routine and then I've come back to my work, I'm so much more motivated. I'm so much more productive. Yeah. So, yeah, rest is 100% part of that equation. And my music taste differs depending on what I'm doing. Obviously, um, I don't listen to hard UK drill or hard rap. Like, okay. Yeah. Seven, but I definitely use that type of music to hype myself up for a fight. Yeah. Um, but part of the fight experience is actually understanding that our mood is like, I don't know how you call this, median rhythm. So um, if you're constantly at this peak, then, like, you're never actually going to peak. Like, you're always, like, streamlined. So um, I actually contrast the way that, like, I want my mood to be. For example, like, the hours before my fight, I won't be listening to hard UK drill or hard UK rap. I'll be listening to classical music or, like, R&B, something chill. And then as my fight gets closer... I start to take my caffeine, I start to put on that hype music and I really like use that contrast to like boost yeah. myself up. So yeah, I really think it's, it's like another part of it, like um, understanding that you can't always be in one state, like yeah. we're constantly changing like our hormones, like our mood, yeah, everything. Yeah. So yeah. Well, that's all the questions I have. Thank you so much for being on this show. Yeah, no, it was a pleasure. Thanks so much for having me. I feel so honored that you like asked <laughs> found me like how did you even find me was it just like that book recommendation yeah or? it is from that I, I i i know i talked to you about the book recommendation i know you were a fighter and then i just came to me because we, we had a lot of guests planned on the show but they were all like in late august and october so we had like a month in between i didn't have that many guests lined up i was like let me let me get her up because she's a fighter oh, okay. she's interesting yeah. So, yeah and also like yeah i want to talk to somebody that's like athletic because all of my guests have been like in education and academia and I wanted to have someone that's like athletic and had like, and you have a really smart, inspiring story too, right? Like, 
I, I still can't believe that you moved from Australia to Germany by yourself. So yeah. it's like, I want, I want to know more about that. So that's why I uh, hit you up again. Okay, cool. Yeah, thank well, you thank so much for so having me. Yeah, coming yeah, the show. <laughs> and, yeah, no, that's great. Uh, thank you. And if you want to share anything to the audience that I might have missed, you're welcome to do it right now. Okay, yeah. Well, like, if anyone wants to contact me, feel free. My Instagram, my YouTube, my TikTok, Tina Velavanis. It's, like, the same everywhere. Yeah, we'll have it on the in the description yeah. awesome yeah so like yeah. if anyone wants to reach out feel free i'm open and um yeah thanks for listening i hope like people got value out of my story that's like yes, yes. I'm that's sure the main thing yeah. yeah it definitely is like inspired me a lot like i'm trying trying to like figure out okay do i want to continue with my like career i mean i'm still doing my engineering but i have other passions outside like i'm writing and doing filmmaking and stuff so i'm like mm-hmm. watching and like, i'm gonna pursue it too I'm, I'm gonna take the chance pursue what yeah. i want to do so yeah all right, awesome, yeah. Thank you so much. All right, guys, that was episode number eight. Um, make sure you guys like, subscribe, and comment down which kind of uh, guest do you want to see in the forward? You want to see another athlete, another, another professor? Please let us know. And that's it. See you guys next time.